I'm Connie Sugart, Assistant Project Coordinator with StarNet Regions 1 and 3. Welcome to another edition of Apple's Magazine. In this video, Dr. Bob Rockwell shares his expertise and experiences involving teachers and children in science. As noted in the book, Mud Pies to Magnets, a Preschool Science Curriculum, the acquisition of facts is not the goal for science with young children. Instead, we want children to experience the success and joy that comes from finding the answers to the questions by doing things rather than by being told. Sharing these experiences with children is an exciting role for parents and teachers. We had the opportunity to visit with Bob Rockwell, who shared his insights into how children discover and learn. That really didn't begin till about 1980, uh, 1980 when I uh, wrote a book with a couple of my colleagues at the university, uh, which involved environmental education and science, and that book was titled Hug a Tree. Uh, still, actually, is still uh, available. And uh, since that time, I've written uh, uh, about 17 science books for teachers of young children. I find it very interesting because uh, one of the things that, that uh, always has stood out to me as a, as a trainer of teachers is that many teachers have a fear of doing science. They have a science phobia. Uh, and that's not just true of just preschool teachers, but also elementary teachers. Uh, and uh, it was always a goal of mine to try to show uh, my students and people that I train that there's no need to be uh, afraid of science. There's no need to fear the S word uh, because it can be a fun, a fun and exciting experience. And it especially, uh, it is this modeling, I think, that if we as teachers have a fear of it, we model that to our children. And as we model that to our children, we're really modeling a negative effect, which then makes them afraid. Uh, they're afraid they're going to fail uh, at doing the experiment. They're afraid that it's uh, going to be too messy. They're afraid that it's, they don't have enough equipment and materials. There's just re many, many different reasons. And it's always been my goal to try to help teachers and uh, my students to uh, overcome that uh, phobia. This is another activity that is super duper in the fall. Mm -hmm. However, you can do it any time. Uh, we did it this past summer at a workshop mm -hmm. using flowers. Okay. You can also use berries. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to do, <coughs> these, these happen to be made in the fall. You're going to go out and get your leaves that have fallen from the trees. You may even want to pick a few off of the tree that have started to color. Reds, greens, yellows, everything. A little bit of everything. You're going to put put them on here. And just conjure up in your mind there is a leaf here, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to cover that leaf with a piece of sheet. Mm -hmm. It's just a regular sheet. You can get these donated from parents as well. Mm -hmm. Put that over your leaf. Okay? This is definitely an activity that should be done on the floor. Okay? On the floor. And even at that, you might like to put a few newspapers underneath to mm -hmm. absorb it. Okay? Mm -hmm. The leaf is under there. Mm -hmm. You start pounding on it. Okay? Mm -hmm. And as you pound on it, you begin to get the shape. Mm -hmm shape of a leaf starts coming through and you'll see that mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. you don't have to pin put pins in here this will stay by itself so you just keep hitting that I think that uh, teachers avoid doing science in the classroom for a number of reasons and I have had the opportunity of traveling uh, not only uh, in the United States but also overseas and asking the same question uh, of early childhood teachers and they give me a, a number of different reasons, and I'll share some of them uh, with you. Uh, one of the first ones that they will tell me is, I was never good at it, and I, and I never liked it. 
And I always respond to that, well, if you weren't good at it and you never liked it, there has to be a reason for that. What, what, what are some of the reasons? And uh, they'll go back and maybe they'll talk about a particular teacher, maybe. Uh, they may talk about a, an experience that they had and they failed. Um, and so my response, uh, again, is it's probably because of the way you were taught. Often we, in, in the early years, so <laughs> we were taught uh, to uh, read and regurgitate. It's called the R&R &R method. And, 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 and we only did experiments that uh, would work. And, and often we didn't do experiments at all. It's amazing to me as I talk to teachers that very, a lot of them will tell me they never did any science, never had any science experiences. And I've talked to others who were told that, uh, uh, that uh, they uh, had to memorize and then feedback uh, on paper. Uh, what what uh, the experiment was about, and often the experiments were they were taught that way instead of hands on, where you actually interact and with the materials and with the person that you're working with, which can make it very interesting if you work was together with someone. Uh, also, that you don't have to regurgitate or memorize something and then send it right back and then instantly forget about it because you're not using it. Another reason is children will ask me questions that I can't answer. That's a great one. When you think about preschool children, the average four-year-old will ask 475 questions a day. Uh, there isn't a preschool teacher that is watching this that, can't, that can tell me that they are not constantly bombarded with questions from children. Can you answer all of them? There's no way you can answer all those questions. It's impossible. But you need to then say, you know, if, if, I, if I can't answer a question and I don't know the answer to it, okay, let's see if we can find the answer that, to that together. Or you might pose a question if they're eating an ice cream cone why, and they're eating it outside. Why, is, why do you think your ice cream is melting? And the child might even ask that. Well, I wonder what that could be. Maybe we can find out together. And then they think a little bit, let me just talk a little bit about, it's hot today. You think maybe, you know, that that might have an effect. Maybe if we would go inside. But to try to seek the answers with the children, look, look, the, look up things together. I did a radio show one time where they called in and um, asked ask that particular question. And I and I, uh, uh, rather the interviewer asked me, and and she asked one of the parents, well, what do you say in a situation like that? And then the, and the parent even, the parent said, let's see if we can find the answer together. That quest of seeking information and knowledge together to make it exciting, and to show a sense of wonder, just as a kid is showing a sense of wonder. Young children are natural wonders. And, and, and that's a beautiful thing that shouldn't be quashed. Another reason uh, was uh, that teachers will give me for not doing science is it's too messy. I always enjoy getting that uh, as a reason for not doing science, especially when I'm doing science uh, workshops with uh, preschool and primary grade teachers because I will have all these materials there and it's just so interesting to see what they gravitate to. And it's always the wet and messy things. They like water and they like to make messes. Well, so do children. And what do you do when you make a mess? There's a lesson here. You clean it up. And, and you can also prepare your classroom for that. Put down drop cloths. You can get a drop cloth for practically nothing at, you know, at Walmart or at Kmart, someplace like that. Uh, a, a drop cloth or a, a, a piece of plastic of some sort to put it down on the floor and that'll take care of the water. Um, another reason would be that uh, it leads to noisy and unruly behavior. That is always fascinating to me because it, it, science can be noisy, and that's exciting, especially when kids are curious and they're working together and they're, they're, they really want to share their experience with other people. So there's going to be talking. And it's just not to the teacher, it's to the person around them. Look what's happening. See, see, see this. Look, oh, I can't believe this. You know, that type of thing. Well, that's great. And 
often teachers will say to me, well, my principal comes by and looks in the window and kind of, oh, I don't know, I'm making a lot of noise in here. Well, when that happens, just invite your principal in and let the principal be a part of this excitement to see what's going on. And, and it can be catching. But communication is a critical component of science. We're communicating with each other. We're communicating our observations. This is really critical for preschool kids. I'm going to look well, this is an activity that's that's done at the sand table. Mm -hmm. I've got confetti, and I have got some bingo wands here. Mm -hmm. And I have something buried in the confetti. Just hold it a few, few inches up above mm -hmm. and see what happens. I had a bigger bucket. Oh, I found something. Yeah. <laughs> Your turn, Shirley. It requires materials that are too expensive. No, it doesn't. All the materials that we use in our workshop are materials that you can find in your garage, in your kitchen, uh, at the drugstore, uh, at the grocery store. You do not have to spend a lot of money. Now, often teachers uh, and administrators are sucked into buying science kits from publishers, and science kits can be very expensive. It can be $500, $600 for a, a Rubbermaid tub uh, filled with some experiments and materials. The problem with that is what happens when the materials are gone? You have to replenish it. You have to keep buying things, so you spend all this money. We can do the very same thing by picking up the materials yourself, uh, or perhaps having your parents donate them or even members of the community to donate them. Now, the science books that I have done, uh, all of the science books that I have done over the years, uh, it's one of the things that we have really been very proud of, uh, that we always focus on uh, materials that are used in the activities that are inexpensive or even oh free. Goodness. Egg cartons, uh, Rubbermaid tubs, these wash tubs. Uh, I happen to have here a, uh, a, a paint roller, okay? A little paint roller and all that. that I'm putting an activity in there. Uh, that doesn't cost any money. Toilet paper rolls. I could, I could think of a, about 50 things you can do with toilet paper rolls, which I won't go into now, but if you give, if teachers will just give it a thought. Uh, you can make binoculars with them. You can make balances for a, uh, a, a balance. Uh, you can use, uh, use them to do construction, uh, build pyramids. You can make bird feeders, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on forever. I don't have any place to store my materials. Well, I'll tell you something, teachers. You have the same place to store your materials that I have, the trunk of your car. You have a basement if you're lucky. You may have an attic where you can store your stuff. I personally like to put things in Rubbermaid tubs or in large boxes, and I put all of my activities in Ziploc bags, and I label the activity by its name, and I put the instructions inside for my own use uh, and uh, also for, for the use of anybody that would be working with me in the classroom. And I can replenish those as I, as I need them. But I never have had to spend very much money uh, for uh, materials to store uh, things in. So use your closets, use your trunk, just like you're doing now. And if you have a van, just you've got a lot of room in the back. It's not related to our curriculum. It's another reason I get. I have heard that many, many times. Science is indeed related to all areas of curriculum. What I want you to do is count for me, okay, as I take them from the shelf. So let's start with this block. This is? One. Two. Two. Okay. Three. We get into this lockstep that we can only teach math at math. We can only teach literacy at literacy. We can only do motor development when the kids are outside and doing some motor activities. If you really take a close look and you dissect the activity, uh, any science activity, you will find that it has relationships to math, to uh, uh, to movement, large motor, gross motor, uh, fine motor. Uh, you will find that it has a uh, relationship to literacy because there are so many books that can embellish and stories that can embellish what you're 
uh, trying to teach. Do you think they would fall down by themselves? No. You don't think so? Okay, let's stack them up again. Okay, you want to stack them up? Set them up? Very good. Okay, Emily, you want to help too? The experiments won't work. Yeah, that's uh, always an interesting question, and it's one that it goes back to the science phobia business again. And we always like to be able to do an experiment uh, uh, for, uh, for and with uh, the kids uh, uh, that will work. And we seem to have that ingrained in us maybe from high school. I don't know, because I talk to high school teachers that, at, when they're talking about their phobia, we said, well, every, every experiment, experiment that we did when we were in high school and we did in elementary school, they always worked. Well, but we didn't do very many. No, we didn't do very many. Okay, well, that's probably why. Scientists always fail. That's what science is about. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. The light bulb took, he, he, he failed 8,000 times before he even got it right. And that's what science is about. It's that curiosity that, and, and trying to make it work. So we'll try another way. That's what, that's science. We'll try another way, another method to see if it will work this way. And there's so many, many, many different variables. And the more you do it, the more variables enter into it. And the closer you observe and, and see what variables are affecting the outcome of a particular experiment. One I really always uh, like to mention when this question is asked of me is one that I frequently use uh, in my workshops. And uh, I know most of the teachers that are watching are familiar with this. It's, it's Duncan raisins, and sometimes we call them jumping raisins or bouncing raisins. And you're putting the raisins into a mixture of baking soda and, uh, and water, and you put in a little vinegar, and you put the raisins in, and what happens? The raisins all go to the bottom. And then something will happen. Well, if, if something doesn't happen, meaning they'd come up to the top, Everyone gets frustrated. I say, well, this isn't working. It's not working. And workshop after workshop, I've been in somewhere, they've been in with me for uh, about two hours, and they keep saying, well, it never did work. Well, sometimes after they leave and they're eating lunch, it starts working. So I'll run, I'll just pick it up and take it down, and I'll show it to them. I say, it's working. I wonder what the variables are on that. Well, the variables, uh, what happens in the, when the bubbles form when, from the baking soda and the vinegar, it, when those bubbles form on the raisin, it actually is like putting a, uh, a bubble on, a, on something uh, that will be in the bottom, and a, a large bubble will bring it up. So when you put air in it, it comes up. Well, when it comes up to the top, the bubble bursts. It goes back down. Get some more bubbles, up it comes. And that's how it works. A major variable in that activity is warm water. Use warm water up and down. Cold water, they stay down there until the water warms up. And that's why when I did that activity at that workshop, the water was still cold. They poured the water in from their uh, pitchers of ice water. And until that water warmed up a couple of hours later, it wouldn't work. So there is the variable. And those are. Basically, those are the major reasons that I get uh, for teachers uh, not wanting to do science. To get started again uh, would be to uh, look at the materials, uh, resources that are available. And certainly my books are very good resources for that. And there are lots of good early childhood science books out there. But you never judge a book by its cover. You go out and take a look at it and open it up or read it and see, are, are these things that I could do that I would feel comfortable doing with young children? Are they developmentally appropriate? Do I have the materials or are the materials available that I can do it with? And uh, go from there. I think also they might want to talk to uh, someone uh, that uh, does workshops uh, in uh, science and uh, attend some of those workshops. And the educational service centers offer those, I know, frequently around uh, the state of Illinois. And I have done lots of them. And uh, uh, that, to me, uh, the in-service training would be the best way. How can we group that? 
Probably one of the uh, most important uh, science uh, activities and, and areas of science would be uh, the uh, focusing of, of children's observations. And you can have, there are many, many activities where they would actually be focusing their observations. And after they focus their observations and watch an activity, do an activity, and then they will communicate that with other people. Uh, classifying, uh, there's another uh, area, uh, cl classifying of um, uh, materials. And again, very appropriate for kids because they just seem to grav gravitate toward sorting. I have an activity uh, that is in the Everybody Has a Body book, which involves odd socks, odd socks. And obviously, those are very easy to get a hold of in any home. Uh, and you have a collection of odd socks, and the odd socks are thrown on the floor. And I, I've, I've done this many times with young children. and. I don't even have to tell them how to do the activity. You know, this is what we're going to do today. I don't have to do that. Just dump the odd socks on the floor. And I have actually done this many, many times. And with young children, and suddenly they just begin to sort them. They're sorting them. And, and as they sort them, they're classifying. These are mommy socks. These are daddy socks. These are baby socks. Okay? Uh, these are blue socks, these are red socks, these are yellow socks. These socks have letters on them. Amazing. Again, don't even have to say, now I want you to sort the socks. No, you don't even have to tell them that. So it's, an, it's very appropriate. And, it's, and again, it's, it's classifying. And, uh, in a, in a, again, in a fun uh, way that is perfectly appropriate for young children. We're going to find out if they're a bobber or a bottomer. And this one, when we hold it under, do you think it's going to be a bobber or a bottomer? What do you think? Bottomer. A bottomer? And what do you think? A bobber. A bobber. Let's let, we're going to let go and let's see what happens. An inappropriate activity for a child, a young child, might be to uh, expect them to understand, understand what would sink and what would float. Again, they need to discover it on their own. And if you actually say, now, what's, what's, what would sink and what would float? And a child might take, depending again on the age, um, one ex one. Uh, Example I can give you would be uh, of a little boy that was about, uh, I think, about three and a half, uh, and a little girl that was four and a half. And he had a metal car, and the water was there and uh, in, the, in the water table. And the little girls, they were, they were talking about things that sink or float. And the, little, and the little girl said, that car will sink. And he says, no, it won't. The car doesn't doesn't sink, and she said, "Well, yes, it is. It'll go to the bottom." No, it doesn't sink. The car goes, so it doesn't sink, and that was his response. So developmentally, he wasn't really ready to get that concept that the little girl indeed knew she had it. So, I think there again, as a teacher, how would you you know how would you uh, teach this? Well, you would teach it by providing the water for the children and providing the different materials that sink in the float and let them discover for themselves what would sink or float. We have an activity uh, in our Discovery Science books that is called uh, Bottomers and Bobbers. Bottomers and Bobbers, which is an, a takeoff uh, on the old sink or float theory. And in the bottomers or bobbers, you have your tub of water, and you have some materials that will sink, and you have some materials that will float. For instance, this film canister, this empty film canister, when you put it in water, is going to float. This rock, probably going to go to the bottom. And you may be asking, and I've done this with, with teachers and watched them interact with kids, and they're actually, while they're doing this, they're going to tabulate what the kids are saying. So they're charting and they're tabulating. They're also getting seen this concept. Is it a bobber or is it a bottomer? 
and you put it, they put it in the water and try it. So they put the rock in the water. What is that? That's a bottomer. And then maybe they put a cork or this. Put it in the bottom. They put it in the bottom. It comes right up to the top. That's a bobber. That really is a bobber. <laughs> or that's a bobber. Bottomer or a bobber. We had a little boy doing this, uh, and uh, we had an Idaho potato, an Idaho potato, and we weren't sure what was going to happen with us either. And so he put this Idaho potato down in the bottom of the, the, the tub of water, and he looks at it, and the teacher says, is that a bottom or a bobber? And he has this puzzled look on his face. And she says again, is that a bottom or a bobber? And he still has this puzzled look on his face. And what's happening is the mass of this potato, it isn't going to come to the top, and it's not going to stay on the bottom. Okay? It's right in the middle. And so she keeps asking, is it a bottom or a bobber? He says, it's a potato. <laughs> I wonder what makes that move. You push it in and it goes around and the, it makes it go here. I've always worked with scientists as I do the books. Always. All of, all of my co-authored with scientists. And uh, to come up, we'll brainstorm and then come up with some really neat ideas and then go from there. And once you really open your mind to it and, you know, free yourself to really check check out some of these things. And, and what I, I kind of really focus on what kids will enjoy, what they'll react to, what they'll have fun doing. Just to do some something. I can give you a million things of science, but they're not, they're not any fun. So, number one, the, the teacher's not going to want to do it. And number two, how are they going to encourage a kid to do something that's not any enjoyable. Look in the holes. What's in the holes here? What color? Green. Green. And you have yellow. Do you want to attach and see? Something that's going to make you focus your observations, make you be curious. I wonder what's going to happen. You know? And I wonder what will happen if I, that type of thing. How do we learn best? We learn best by doing, you know? And that's true. You didn't learn to drive a car by reading the rules of the road. It doesn't happen. You've got to get out there and do it. So, Ethan, what do you think's in there that's going to roll? A crayon? Why do you think the crayon rolled? Because it looks like, one, like a wood thing. Okay, but what, what about its shape? Do you think it's because of the way it's shaped that it rolled? Do you think it's I like to talk to children in kindergarten. I always tell them, I said, you know, uh, you know what a tool is? And they'll say, oh, tool, it's a hammer, it's a saw, it's a screwdriver. And I said, you know, scientists have tools too. And I said, and you were born, you were born with the tools that scientists use. You're born, you have them right now. And you have your nose, you have a sense of smell, you have your hearing, your sense of hearing, you have your eyes, you can see, and the sense of feeling, touch, the sense of touch. These are the senses uh, that scientists use, and uh, you're born with them. Dr. Rockwell certainly dispelled the misconceptions of integrating science into your curriculum. I encourage you to enhance the classroom experience through science and exploration. And by sharing these and other science activities, you will find it opens up a new world of discovery for you and all of the children in your life. Thanks for watching.